Charlie Corbett. Um, I've been in the communications business for about 20 years, or getting on for 20 years, uh, over half of which has been spent as a journalist and editor. Um, the other half, or the other third, has been spent working in the corporate world. So I've seen both sides of the story. I've seen the journalist side of the story, and I've seen the corporate side of the story. Why here? Because, well, we are in Yieldy Cheshire Cheese, one of the oldest pubs in London. It was rebuilt after the Great Fire of London in 1666, which tells you a little bit about its age. It was also the local pub of Samuel Johnson, who, it could be argued, was the original plain speaker, uh, author of the, the, the dictionary and more witty and pithy remarks than I could possibly poke a stick at. But, so I thought it would be very appropriate to do it somewhere where he may well have taken ale. Well, I suppose after a few years of working in the corporate world, having been a journalist beforehand, I'd grown pretty frustrated by the way that people spoke to each other, the way people communicated with each other. I had come from a world where our job had been to get the most amount of information across using the, the, fewer, the um, fewest amount of words um, into a world where you kind of got the least amount of information across using the most amount of words. I wanted to produce a guide that would help people uh, speak and write clearly. There's too much in the corporate world of using words but of obscuring meaning, what we all call jargon. Obviously there's a lot of books about jargon, but it's a little bit more than that. I think we, we use language now that is dehumanising. And um, for example, it's much easier to, to, to fire someone when you regard them as being a human resource. We have human resources departments. Well, that puts us on the same level as coal. And you don't get fired anymore, you get restructured. So it's much easier for a chief executive to restructure a human resource out of its job than to fire Bob, who's worked there for 25 years. So, so language is very important. I mean, George Orwell was onto this in 1940s. You use language uh, to can be used to obscure things, when actually we should be using our language to make our meaning clearer. And when you use language to make your meaning clearer, you will stand out from the crowd. People will notice you. Uh, so much of what goes on in the corporate world, what is written and spoken in the corporate world, is kind of platitudinous waffle. And we, we use these words, we hide behind this jargon, because perhaps maybe we're, we're all a little bit insecure about our jobs, we want to sound like the rest, we want to be part of the gang, but actually, the people who really do succeed in business are the ones who are able to articulate their ideas in the, in the clearest possible terms, using short words, plain English. I've always felt that it's not a good idea, or you don't understand the idea, if you can't articulate that idea in the shortest, clearest way possible. And that's what this book, I hope, is going to help people to do. In journalism, you're, you're taught to write in a way that is clear, purposeful and engaging. And in business, people forget the engaging bit. People just write or speak using the words that they've heard used a thousand times all around them. They don't think hard enough, I think, about the message they are trying to convey and then use words, simple, plain English, to convey that message. And the most important thing, of course, which seems so obvious, is if you want people to read what you're writing or, or listen to what you're saying, it's quite simple, say something interesting. And that's what you have to do as a journalist, otherwise no one's going to read your story. All you want as a journalist is, is for the most amount of people to read your story and then, obviously, because we're all vain, say nice things about it. Or at least start a debate, an argument. And that that is missing, I think, in the corporate world. I think that we are given um, very boring, platitudinous messages that we have to get out there. Things about we are sustainable and our values are this and that. These are all great things, or oh, we're innovative. These are all great, noble ideas, but they're used so much now that they've become meaningless. The brain switches off. The brain cannot 
well, the brain won't notice any more these words. So where you can write a, uh, at the beginning of an article about your sustainable values and how you believe in the environment and your company is going to save the environment. These are, these are words and phrases and ideas that we've heard a thousand times. So what you need to do is you need to stop being a lazy thinker. Think new ways of articulating old ideas. It doesn't mean the ideas are wrong, it just means the words you're using have become hackneyed and the brain switches off. If you want people to read what you've written all the way to the end of your article, then there are certain ways of doing that. And one of those is to say new things in original ways or look at old topics with a new angle. And that does involve thinking quite hard about it and reading. Um, but it isn't impossible, it's not hard. It is so easy just to write the usual mantra that we hear and see every day on every corporate perspective. I always use the word innovation as an example. Everybody says they're innovative these days. Name somebody, name a company that isn't innovative or doesn't call itself innovative. This is an overused word. It's become utterly meaningless. And if you write that, splash that all over your marketing material, it shows only one thing, that you've run out of ideas or you've run out of ways to tell the world about what you do and why it's important. It's important for an individual in business to write and speak clearly and with purpose. I mean, I shouldn't have to explain it, but in, in this world where if you imagine all the words and phrases of this, this great grey ocean, you know, you need to be the colourful yacht on top of that grey ocean and you'll get noticed. So if you do, and it's really easy because you just use plain English, you, you speak and write, well write as you speak for a start and speak as though you were talking always to an intelligent friend. Always write everything, no matter how complex the business you work in is, always write a sentence that your granny could understand. Because that is the best way to get your point across because people want simplicity. People don't have time. They, they whiz through, everything is now digital, they whiz through uh, uh, their web browser. They don't have time to stop. They never read more than about 50 words. Your headlines, your writing, it's important that you get your point across very, very quickly because you will lose them. You will lose them almost immediately. As soon as you, you tell people about your insights into something, you, they switch off because they see the word insight everywhere. I, was, I, saw, I saw a famous consultant that had a, a part of its website was called Our Insights and then the sub, subtitle was Insights You Can Trust and the beginning of the article was Our Unique Insight on XYZ. Well that was about three or four insights before we got into the article. I looked at the first paragraph and there was another two insights. Insights become meaningless. It used to be quite a useful word but it's meaningless so we need to think again about how we're going to articulate these ideas and if you do that as an individual you will stand out it's 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 the time is right <laughs>Good question. New ideas and how can you be sure that they're good? Well, with the second part, you can never be sure that they're good until you share them with people. And I think that what people are often afraid of in meetings is of sharing their ideas. People think that, that it might be a stupid idea. And as I say in the book, the, 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 the only stupid people in the world are the people who don't share that, their ideas. And actually, the, the most stupid are the people who scoff at other people's ideas. There is no such thing as a bad idea. Uh, there's an idea that it ha may not have its time, there's an idea that doesn't work now, but there's no such thing as a bad idea. And the more ideas you come up with, one day, one of those ideas is going to hit the mark. But if you don't keep coming up with ideas, then no idea is going to hit the mark. In terms of how to come up with original ideas, well, there's lots of different ways. But the first, and probably the, the hardest, the thing we have least time for these days is to read. We need to read. Read everything. Read everything to do with your business, read fiction books, non-fiction books. Reading is the front line of ideas generation and it's the front line of good writing. The, the best writers I know are the biggest readers. They, 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 they develop a curious personality, they, they, they read voraciously and so they write well and they're always coming up with good ideas. And, and so if reading is the, the front line then, then the, the communications trench is, is just speaking to people, talk to everybody, and it doesn't, again, have to be directly linked to your business. 
It can be anyone you meet. It can be, as I said, the old soak at the end of the bar. It can be the bloke who empties the bins. It can be the CEO. It could be anyone because ideas are about communication, communicating with one another, bouncing ideas off each other. And that's how eventually you'll get originality and just never be afraid to, to share an idea. I mean, in the book, I do talk a lot about how to foster these. I think speaking to people and reading a lot is one idea. Of course, it's hard to read a lot, so you need to create a kind of reading infrastructure. I use Twitter as a news feed, so that's always, I'm linked to all the people in my business, so I use it as a news feed. I try not to comment on things because you kind of get eaten alive on Twitter. Um, and I have a daily email digest from something linked to my business, uh, my trade, and then I might also read the FT, an FT email in my inbox every morning, so that's two things. Don't overcrowd it, don't try and read everything. Just find the, the most important things to you and your business. And then also, always have a novel on the go, always, always have a book that's not directly linked to your work. Don't just talk to clients about your work, be an interesting person. Um, so that's, that's, that's the reading side, I've talked about the speaking side. I think also we need to rest and exercise. I think spending too much time sitting at your desk looking at a computer screen is not good for ideas. Ideas don't come in meetings that are specifically designed to come up brainstorming, just a waste of time really. Uh, ideas come at you in the middle of the night or when you're making a piece of toast because you've, you've lodged that seed in your brain and it, it'll just quietly germinate without you even knowing about it. And if you keep reading, keep speaking to people, suddenly ideas will pop up. Write them down, keep a notepad and piece of paper, write them down and they will come. And, and things like resting, things like exercising, it's a great, I think, misused aphorism, which was, is carpe deum, which everyone thinks means seize the day. And then they rush around manically, climbing Everest, jumping out of aeroplanes, seizing everything. Actually, Horace, who was the Roman poet, I'm pretty sure, who, who came up with that, was an Epicurean. He, he liked the things in life that were readily available all around him. It was all about appreciation and actually the translation of Carpe Diem, or one translation of Carpe Diem, is taste the day, which is a totally different thing to seizing the day. And I think if we all just tasted the day a bit more, we would be better off and your brain would be better off. It's a muscle, it needs resting, just like your legs and your arms do. And when you rest it, you will find that it will be much better machine coming up with ideas for you that will impress your colleagues and your boss. Well, it's important to write well because you want to get your point across in the clearest possible way, and you, you need to do that using short words, short sentences, full stops are free, as my first editor used to say. It's important to write well because you'll win more business by doing so in the corporate world, you will arrest people's attention. If you're a good writer, uh, good writing is like a glass of ice-cold lemonade on a hot day. It cuts through the heat and, and, and refreshes you. And if you can write like that, it will stand out and people will notice you and they'll notice your writing and they'll read from the beginning of your article to the end, you would hope. Because it's incredibly important to get your point across. In the, in the simplest way possible, particularly in business. If you're making a pitch or you're trying to convince someone to buy something or, or, or use your service, you need to be able to articulate that in the clearest possible way. And the only way to do that is, is, is to be able to write well in a way that's concise and sparing and not in a way that includes lots of platitudinal waffle and buzzwords and jargon. We need to strip that out, get back to bare bones and be obsessed with our audience. Because you must think very, very hard about who you're writing for. People don't do that. This is what journalists do. They think about their reader all the time. And the best writers will tend to picture an individual. They'll always write for an individual, for a person. They'll picture that person in their mind, their, their background, their hobbies, their age, socioeconomic status. All these things, if you think about them when you're writing, will make your writing relevant and it'll make it engaging. And if you make your writing relevant and you make it engaging, it's not just people reading a story in a newspaper, it's the people in business who will notice you, who will say, this guy, this girl, they can get their point across 
quickly and easily and yeah, sure, I, I get it, I really get it. Uh, I will buy this product or I, I will use this service. Grammar is a minefield. There are two types of people in terms of writing. There are these smug grammarians who terrify everybody about whether to use who or whom or, or not end a sentence with a preposition and it terrifies everyone and it, it actually it does great harm because people think, well I can't write because I don't understand grammar. It's absolute rubbish. Being good at grammar doesn't make you a good writer. In the same way that being, knowing how to build a wall doesn't make you a good architect. Good writing comes kind of from here and, and you're writing as you speak. The only lessons in grammar you need to know really, the basic tools are full stops and commas. So start with that, learn how to use those, be very easy going on the full stops. They are free, so use them a lot. Um, all you need to be thinking about in writing is forget all the, the obscure grammatical ticks that you half remember from childhood and just make sure you are very clear and concise and plain in what you want to say. Think about what you want to say and then say it in the clearest possible terms. When you've written the sentence, reread it and say, have I said what I wanted to say and have I said it in the clearest possible terms? I'm not saying grammar is important isn't important, it is integral. And more than that, good grammar is good manners. But don't be terrified by these, I think Kingsley Amis called them petty linguistic tyrants, who will admonish you for saying, using the word whom instead of who, or who instead of whom. Forget all that, and don't use whom anyway, because you don't want to sound like the Dowager Countess in Downton Abbey all the time. Just use who and be clear, but most importantly, be clear about what it is you want to say and then say it in the clearest possible terms. And do not be intimidated by smug grammarians. In terms of creating compelling corporate communications, awful phrase, and it is a cliche, which I say you shouldn't use, but you need to get back to basics. So you need to be able to distill the essence of what you do, what your company does, in a very short sentence that you could tell anyone on the street and they'd understand you. That is a lot harder than you think. I cannot tell you when I was running my consultancy how many meetings I sat in, endless meetings, I have nightmares about them, meetings that I sat in which were entitled, who are we? And you'd get the heads of the business in, the most important person in marketing, and you spend six hours trying to find out who we are, and nobody knew. And my job was to help them articulate who they were, and I would come up with a few ideas and say, well, I think you're this, this, and that from an outsider's perspective, but they wouldn't like that because it was too simple, too short. They, people tend to prefer to overcomplicate their business to make them sound clever, and, and, and actually what you're doing is, is mystifying your audience, so they're just going to switch off because they're bored. If you, if you want to get your message out there, it's got to be simple. And so once you've articulated who we are in a short sentence, not easy, then you need to come up with your values, your core messages. You want to get the world to know about you. What do you want the world to know about you? Well, with this, with this and with that. No more than three to five at most. And once you've got your three or five messages that you want the world to know about you, that will infuse everything you do, every advert you place, every article you write, every post you put on LinkedIn, will show the world, demonstrate those values. Don't just tell people all the time that you're innovative and sustainable and great, wonderful people. Show the world. There's too much telling. Demonstrate via practical, interesting examples why you're good at your job and why whoever it is, your, your client or potential client, should hire you. So if you want to stand out from the crowd, stand out in your job, obviously the first thing you need to do is write and speak in a way that is clear and full of meaning, um, avoiding jargon and buzzwords. Outside of that, I have a chapter in my book entitled How to Stand Out in Your Job. I did consider calling it effective internal communications and then I thought well if I did that I would be 
using words without any real meaning. We hear effective internal communications or his little sibling internal comms all the time. What does it mean? What does it mean? I'd need to go and ask someone in human resources what that means and they would probably not be able to explain it properly. What we mean by effective internal communications is getting on with people so you can do your job better. So the first lesson has to be, don't use the phrase inter effective internal communications. And the second is, get on with everybody. It can be hard, but work with people. Don't be ambitious. Don't try and get ahead of people. Just be well-mannered. It's quite old fashioned, polite. Treat people with dignity and respect and work hard. I mean, it's all the obvious things. Um, but at the heart of it all is being able to articulate your ideas in a way that is, is, is simple, clear and with humanity. When it comes to your CV, I think what a lot of people get wrong is they forget about the message they're trying to get across and they fill it with, uh, with platitudes again. They fill it with, with buzzwords and jargon. So rather than trying to tell a story and match your skills to the job you're applying for, you'll write waffle like, I'm a highly motivated, outcome-focused, dynamic self-starter. Name one CV, one person who isn't. And what is outcomes-focused anyway? What does that mean? I decide to get dressed in the morning. That makes me outcome-focused. It, it's, it's not, it's, it's telling people vague platitudes about yourself and not telling people why you're good at your job. I beat the sales record on this. Uh, if someone tells me, they've climbed Mount Everest. I know with absolute clarity that they have guts and stamina. They don't need to tell me that. They're probably dynamic too. Everyone's dynamic. And rather like innovative, name a company or a person that doesn't describe themselves as dynamic. We need to find new ways to articulate why we're the best at this job and why you should employ me. And the reason is because I'm bloody good at this and this is how I can prove it. So with CVs, keep them short. Keep them to a page. Less is more. Intrigue people. Say something interesting about yourself. Do not fill it with vague waffle about being a dynamic self-starter who's outcome-focused. First thing to remember about public speaking is that everyone gets nervous the greatest speakers and actors ha had stage fright. Laurence Olivier, Stephen Fry has terrible stage fright. So you're not alone. If you're nervous before a big speech or presentation, always remember that you're not alone in this. And in fact, anyone who tells you that they're not nervous before they go and make a, a, a public speech is either a liar or they're not very good at public speaking. Because it is those nerves that drive you forward. It's, that, is your, that is your fight or flight instinct kicking in. And it will, it will push you forward. It'll, and, and it'll make you a more interesting person to listen to. If you're bored and complacent, no one's going to listen to you. It's why people get more nervous speaking in front of their family and friends than they do speaking in front of a corporate audience. Because they care about them. You've got to care about your audience and care about what you're talking about. And of course, it goes back to good writing as well. You want to speak with confidence and you need to never, ever, ever speak for more than about 15 minutes. If someone asks you to speak for 10 minutes, speak for nine minutes. In terms of practical tips, when you're asked to make a speech, I say there's generally five things I would say. There's a lot more than this, but these are five tips I always use. And first of all is, is as I've alluded to before, keep to your time, never overrun. If you've been asked to speak for 10 minutes, speak for nine minutes. There has been research that's shown that 20 minutes is the absolute optimum attention you're going to grab from anyone. So stick to your time. Always, number two, always tell a story. Have a beginning, a middle and an end. That leaves them wanting more. Be amusing. Be funny, but whatever you do, don't try set piece gags or lengthy anecdotes that will leave the audience feeling numb. So it's fine to be amusing and engage people, but don't try and tell them a gag or, or, or worse, some long anecdote. Um, there are a number of techniques and tips uh, that, that 
people use to make good speeches. Go onto the internet, see how Churchill made his speeches, or, or, or um, Martin Luther King, or the great JFKs, the great speech makers. See what they do, what tips do they do, 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 can they impart to you? Um, things like using pause for effect, that kind of thing. So everything that comes in threes is perfect, as the Romans said. Veni vidi vici, liberty, egality, fraternity, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These stick in the mind, so try to think of ways to put your, your, your ideas into, into threes. These are just little tips. So the, fi the final thing is speak slowly. He says speaking very quickly, but if you're on stage, take your time, speak slowly. Nervous people gabble. Confident and assured speakers speak slowly and actually will help with your nerves as well. On top of all of that, when you've been asked to make a speech and you're very nervous, I find go and do the recce of the room if you can beforehand. With nobody in it, go and get used to standing on the stage, looking out over everybody. It will just relax you and mean that when you go up there, it's not for the first time and you'll be at ease with your surroundings. Well, I think the first thing you, you have to think about if you want to use social media is, do I even need to use it? A lot of companies are now thinking, well, do I need to spend all this money on a social media strategy? What is a social media strategy? Well, all social media are really LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram and the gang. They're merely online notice boards. They're another way to get your product or service directly under the nose of a potential client, along with all the other ways. They're not the angry bear coming along to, to steal all the sandwiches at the picnic. I think the problem with social media is, is, is people frequently misuse them. If you're BP or a huge, big conglomerate, you don't need to be on Facebook. You need to choose the right medium for you. That would, in this case, be LinkedIn. LinkedIn, in the, in, obviously I talk a lot in the book about social media and how to use it, but in terms of, of, of mediums, LinkedIn is, is the medium of, of business and, and you behave on LinkedIn as you would in the office. You don't shove pictures of your children on there or optical illusions or, or bad jokes. You know, stick, stick that on Facebook. Facebook, for those people who still use it, uh, is, is, the, is, is, is the pub, it's is home. It's, 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 don't put business on there. Same with, same with Instagram. You know, these are people's personal spaces. Don't invade it with corporate gobbledygook. Um, so pick your medium and work out whether you even need a social media strategy. Um, Weatherspoon's pubs had 44,000 Twitter followers and the, the CEO, Tim Martin, has cut all his social media channels. Uh, he says we don't need them, it's a waste of money. And, and, and he, at the moment, he's been proved right. I'm not saying that we all should. They can be incredibly effective, but you've got to, you've got to know how to use them. I mean, Twitter is a bear pit. You know, companies and politicians, in my opinion, should, should be very, very careful when they use Twitter. Twitter can be a very, very useful device for getting your message out there, but like a chainsaw, I always think, very useful, but if you drop it on your foot, you're in real trouble. And, and so that you have to be very careful. You have to think carefully about your strategy um, and then execute it as part of a, a wider communication strategy. It is not the be all and end all. The other, the other really important thing to say about social media in terms of actually using it every day as an individual is quite simply say something interesting. Don't just um, put up waffle about we're delighted to announce that we've won an award or we're delighted to announce we've hired Tony Bennett. It, 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 people just switch off. The key is two things. Firstly, say something interesting. Secondly, start a conversation. Social media is a conversation. You can't just bombard people with information about yourself and expect them to pay any attention. If you sat at a dinner party or in the pub and just spoke at people about your great achievements, no one is going to want to speak with you or have a conversation. Don't try to sell people stuff, or if you are going to sell people stuff, be honest about it. Don't dress up articles as though they're, they're supposed to be interesting and actually you're just trying to flog someone. People see through that and that destroys your brand and reputation. 
using social media well, you, 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 can, you can start a conversation. You can be, if you're in the corporate world, thought leaders or on a, on a certain subject, but speak intelligently on it and, 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 and in a way that's pithy and, and interesting. I always call it the so what test. Does anything I put on social media pass the so what test? Which is, would I tell someone that in the cafe or the bar if I found that information out? Would I say, oh, that's interesting, did you know that? If it doesn't pass that test, don't post it, don't waste your time. You're actually hurting your brand. Just make sure you say something interesting. Don't just spout boring corporate waffle. First thing to remember about making the press work for you is to understand what motivates the press. I think too many public relations firms and marketing departments really forget the very fundamental reason the press exists, and that is to convey interesting information to readers. Journalists think endlessly about writing interesting stories for their readers. I think too many companies forget this. They just blast out a message, and they don't think about it the end reader. So don't blast out a boring, platitudinous message, they'll just ignore it. So you need to build a relationship with the press, you need to understand what motivates the people who work in the press. But very simply, a journalist has three fundamental motivations. One is they've got an editor to keep happy, they've got a, a deadline to meet and they've got a story to grind out. They, they have to fill a certain amount of space uh, in their newspaper and they want to get that story to the front of the newspaper. All journalists, and I can say this because I'd be one, are pretty vain, so if you want to um, understand journalists, well just flatter their egos. But, they'll never, but also while you're doing that, make friends with them, sure, but they'll never be your friends because the journalists at the end of the day will always, always, the scoop will win. And that scoop might be you one day in a bad way. It might also be in a good way if you've got a good relationship. The point is you need, a, it's a two-way relationship. You can't just blast a message at journalists, they hate it. Um, press releases are a classic example. You have huge, long, waffly headlines and four-page press releases. There's a greater chance of a camel passing through the eye of a needle than a journalist on a national newspaper or website taking any notice of your press release, I'm afraid. The press release should be seen as the very last thing in a process, the last point of a process where you've built up a relationship, you regularly speak to the press. The press release is a one page of no more than 250, 300 words with a short, snappy title that can be used to convey the information the journalist needs to know about the story and with a useful telephone number. That's it, nothing more. Um, and don't send it via email, it'll go straight to the email junk box you need to be phoning up journalists, but don't phone them on their deadline. Find out when their deadline is. Now, you might say, well, I don't need the press, I don't need journalists, they're, 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 they'll, they'll sell their granny for a story. Um, sure, some might, but the vast majority of them are sensible with, with careers uh, that they want to, to foster. They're not going to write stupid stories. They, they'll, they'll need to back up everything they say. Um, you cannot ignore the press. It won't go away, so you may as well build a relationship with it. In this day and age, of course, there are many, many other mediums to get your, your message out there, which we've talked about today via social media particularly. I mean, companies are becoming their own content producers. But that doesn't reduce the importance of certain, the press as strong brands under which to get your message out there. But don't expect journalists to write stories about you just because you, you've sent them a press release about it. They'll ignore you. Um, so understanding the press is what not enough people do and then when it slaps them in the face or they get misquoted or they, which actually well, they should never be misquoted, but when it slaps them in the face then they wonder why. Well because you haven't taken the time to understand what motivates them, who their readers are, when their deadline is, who the editor is, what other stories they've written about your business, what's their personal peccadilloes, etc, etc. Once you do that you've got a much better chance of getting your story to the front of the website of the newspaper um, than if you don't do your research and you just expect them to write stories about you because you sent a press release and then you've got hundreds of people to phone them, which just upsets them. When speaking or writing with clarity, the most important thing to remember is to speak and write 
with clarity, which sounds a silly thing to say, but drum it into yourself. The most important thing is, is think about what you want to say and then say it in the most concise way possible. The only example I can draw with this is the best artists in the world that have ever lived in three or four brush strokes can capture the essence of a person or the essence of a view or a boat or whatever it might be. In the same way, the best writers can capture the most amount of information with the least amount of words. And so that would be, for me, the most important part about writing or speaking with clarity. So Mark Twain, apparently Mark Twain said this, he would write, I'm sorry I wrote you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. And that is the essence about writing well. It is hard to write in a way that it's concise. You have to think about it. George Orwell always said that it is easier, even quicker once you have the habit to write, it is not an unjustifiable assumption, unjustifiable assumption that than to say, I think. Well, I'd like to think that after reading my book, people will be able to be better at coming up with original ideas and then being able to articulate those ideas in a way that's, that's, that's clear and, and meaningful. And by doing so, you will impress the people in life that matter. You will win more business. You will stand out more. You will get promoted. Uh, I think they'll be more confident public speakers, they'll understand that everyone gets nervous and, and once, you know, there's nothing worse than that feeling you have before you get up on stage to make a speech, but there's nothing better than that, than that feeling of when you walk off the stage after you've made your speech. Um, they will know which words to avoid when, when writing with clarity. I've got a chapter at the end on banned words. Well, not banned words, words to uh, avoid if you, want, if you want your writing to stand out. You can use these words if you want, but if you want your writing to stand out, then I would avoid them. Um, so it's, 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 I see it as a, a kind of a one-stop shop for people. I'd like to think it would be a Bible you kept on your, on your desk that you would re could refer to before you had a, a, a pitch to make or before you had a speech to make or you were sitting on a panel. There's lots of information in there that I really hope is helpful. I've talked a lot today about some core concepts, but within there, there is practical advice on how better to stand out in your job, how better to write compelling communications that people will read and will arrest their attention, how, how to use social media that, in a way that is effective and gets your message out there, but in a way that's fun and interesting and not just boring, grey and corporate. Because, sounds philosophical, life is there for living, why should work be boring? Why should we speak in this way at work when we, we, we don't speak in this way at home? Why do we inflict this language on our clients when when we could just speak to them like human beings. So I hope people read it and have more confidence to go into work the next day and just be themselves and not hide behind jargon because that's what insecure people do. When all is said and done, this book really is just about common sense. But I think that great virtue is being lost today, particularly in offices. They've become confusing, insensible places, quite intimidating where we have the language of the technocrat and the bureaucrat, which has crept in. And I think we need to, in a way, sweep that all away and go back to the basics and be human, speak to one another in a way that is human and normal and not this guff and waffle, which gets nobody anywhere. And, and hopefully when people read this book, they'll have the confidence to do that and to be that person and it will help them, it will help them stand out in their job, they will get noticed. Um, so that's, that's why I wrote the book, it's part how-to guide, part a rant from an old hack.